I analyzed over 7,000 days of stock market data on an Excel spreadsheet to find out one thing, if buying the dip actually works. What I found was incredibly interesting, so stay tuned to find out the results. Buying the dip, we're gonna talk about buying the dip. Hear that all over the place, buying the dip. It's like impossible to get this freaking market to go down so we can buy the dip. You have to buy the dip. If you don't, then you are an idiot. Just buy the dip and you will make money too. Buying the dip. This is a strategy that a lot of investors are very passionate about. Financial YouTubers, investment managers that may or may not be past their heyday, and even weird cartoon broccoli men all recommend buying the dip as a way to maximize profits in the stock market. By the way, I have absolutely no idea why that cartoon even exists, but it worked for my intro, so I'm glad that it does. Anyways, I wanted to find out if buying the dip is actually an effective investment strategy, or if it is better to follow other buying strategies instead, such as dollar cost averaging. So I decided to spend six hours creating multiple hypothetical investing simulations over 7,304 trading days to find out just that. But before we get there, let's back up a little. What is buying the dip exactly? It's when you buy into an asset like a stock after it's dropped in price. The belief here is that the new lower price represents a bargain, as the dip is only a short-term blip in the market, and with time, the market will bounce back and increase in value. You're essentially trying to time the market. You refrain from investing whilst building your cash reserve, waiting patiently for the stock market to drop. And when the market finally does drop, you invest the lump sum of cash you've been saving to buy stocks at a cheaper price than before. Your goal here is to buy stocks at the lowest price possible in order to max maximize the amount of profit you make when the stock market rebounds. When you time the stock market dip successfully, it can be great. You can make big, big profits. But the debate centers around how often you can actually time the dip correctly, and if it is possible to time the dip consistently over many market cycles over long periods of time. Because buying the dip can also go very wrong. Let's imagine you're a dip buying connoisseur and the stock market goes down 10%, so you go grab your stockpile of cash to buy the 10% dip. You might be feeling pretty good about yourself because you think you just bought stocks at a 10% discount and secured some easy profits. But then, what if the market continues to decline further? So let's say negative 20%. You might now be thinking, well, surely that's an even better opportunity, right? But unfortunately, you already invested the majority of your spare cash into the first dip. So this time around, you have to find a way to scrounge up the little bit of spare cash you have left to invest into the actual dip. But then it's possible that the market continues its downward trend to perhaps negative 30%. And now you don't have any money to invest into what's known as the dip of the dip. So you call up your grandma to borrow some of her money to buy the dip with. Then the worst thing possible happens. The economy goes into a recession, causing the stock market to overall decrease in value by 40 or 50 percent. And now you for sure don't have a penny to invest into what's known in Wall Street Bets lingo as the dip of the dippity dip dip. And not only do you lose money from not buying the dippiest of the dips, but you potentially miss out on any gains that happened in the stock market whilst you were sitting on the sidelines waiting for the dip to happen. Since it's debatable how effective buying the dip is, I decided to settle this debate by analyzing stock market data to find out if a person is statistically likely to succeed with this strategy. I did my best in this video to not get too much into the weeds of going through all the many steps and calculations I had to do in Excel to accomplish this, because I know for a fact that 99% of people watching this video would instantly click off if I did that, but just know that it took a very long time to do, and so did planning and editing this video as well. So if you could all just give this video a like, I would really appreciate it. Okay, so now let's get into it. The first thing I did was download historical SPY price data. SPY is an ETF that tracks the S&P 500, which is commonly used as a benchmark for the overall stock market. I downloaded exactly 29 years worth of data going back to the 20th of May, 1993. All in all, I had 7,304 days of open, close, high, and low price data to work with. I created a few simulations in Excel to see what would happen if you were to have bought the SPY dip from 1993 all the way to the present in 2022, versus if you were to have instead dollar cost averaged into SPY over the same time period. Dollar cost averaging, if you're not aware, is basically the opposite of buying the dip. You invest a small portion of money on a consistent basis, regardless of what happens to the market. For example, it's common for people to set up a recurring investment in which every time they're paid by their employer, a percentage of their paycheck is automatically invested into their retirement account. So with dollar cost averaging, you're not hoarding cash and trying to time the market lows like you are with buying the dip. Instead, you're consistently investing money into the market, whether the market's up, 
down, it doesn't matter. So for the dollar cost averaging scenario, I had an imaginary dollar cost averager invest $10 into SPY every single trading day from 1993 to 2022, regardless of the price of the ETF. The dollar cost averager over this time period would have invested 7,304 times, in total investing $73,040, and would have ended up with a portfolio worth $241,411. So think of this scenario as the benchmark in which we'll compare the buying the dip scenarios against. If any of the buying the dip scenarios perform better than the dollar cost averaging scenario, then we can conclude that buying the dip is a more effective investing strategy than dollar cost averaging, and vice versa. So I created three different buying the dip scenarios. An investor who buys into the market when it drops by 10% from its recent high, an investor that buys into the market only when it drops 20% from its recent high, and finally, an investor that only buys into the market when it drops by 30%. And to make the dip buying scenarios comparable to the dollar cost averaging scenario, I assume these buying the dip investors also have $10 available to invest every single trading day. But instead of investing the $10 every single day, they of course save up their money until the buying the dip criteria is met and then invest all of their cash on a single day. Then they go back to saving $10 a day again, up until the next dip happens, and so on until the present. So here are the results. For the 10% dip scenario, an investor implementing this strategy that started in May of 1993 would have only bought into the market a total of 13 times, in total investing $72,030, whilst holding an additional $810 in uninvested cash right now, which they would be holding to buy the next 10% dip. Now in 2022, they would have ended up with a portfolio worth $208,233. For the 20% dip scenario, an investor from 1993 to 2022 with this criteria would have only bought into the market a total of four times, investing $67,510, whilst having another $5,530 in uninvested cash. Now in 2022, they would have ended up with a portfolio worth $100 $166,160. What's interesting in this 20% dip simulation is that this investor would have had to wait from the time they started investing in May of 1993 all the way up until February of 2001 to finally buy into the market for the first time. And when they finally did invest, they would have invested $19,600 in a single day. To put that into perspective, that's like telling your friends and family today that you're going to buy some stocks the next time the market dips, and then waiting until the year 2030 to actually do that. Crazy stuff. For the 30% dip scenario, an investor beginning in 1993 with this criteria would have only bought into the market a total of four times, which is the same number of times as the 20% dip scenario. In total, they would have invested $67,550, whilst holding another $5,490 in uninvested cash. And now in 2022, they would have ended up with a portfolio worth $190,436. So now comparing the dollar cost averaging benchmark to the three buying the dip scenarios, we can see that dollar cost averaging is by far the better investing strategy, followed by buying at the 10% dip, then, interestingly enough, in third place is buying the 30% dip, and in last place is buying the 20% dip. The reason buying the 30% dip outperformed buying the 20% dip is because every time the market went below minus 20%, it also continued to go down to below minus 30%. There wasn't any times when the market went down between 20 and 30%, which would be needed to trigger a 20% dip buy without triggering a 30% dip buy, if that makes any sense. I think if we were to do the same analysis on an even larger data set, maybe 100 years or so, then I think the greater the dip you attempt to buy at, the worse your portfolio would perform over the long run, because your cash would spend more time sitting on the sidelines instead of being invested into the market making gains. I know there's also another way that people buy the stock market dip, and that is buying dips that occur on a specific trading day. For example, an investor might decide to buy stocks only when a dip of 2% happens on a single day, so I ran an analysis on three more scenarios buying at 0.5%, 1%, and 2% intraday dips, starting again in 1993 and ending today in 2022. If you were to have saved your $10 a day and only bought at 0.5% dips, then you would have ended up with a portfolio worth $240,291. If you bought at 1% dips, you would have $240,857. And if you bought at only 2% intraday dips, you would have $235,365. And if we compare all of these again to the $241,411 you would have had if you were to have dollar cost averaged over this time frame, we arrive at the same conclusion again, that buying the dip is not as effective as simply just dollar cost averaging. Although with this method of 
buying intraday dips, you do get much closer to the dollar cost averaging number than the other method of buying the dip. But still, dollar cost averaging is the way to go. Right now, the S&P 500 is down around 15 to 20% from its peak at the start of this year. And there's really good reason to believe that more pain is coming in the stock market. If you have a strong conviction that the market is going to crash further, trust me, I know. It's going to be really tempting to try and wait for the market to go down just a little further before buying in. But as my analysis has proved, time in the market is more important than timing the market. So if you're hoarding cash right now and planning to only buy when stocks go down further, my own recommendation is that you instead begin dollar cost averaging into a broad stock market index fund as soon as possible. Spread out your investment over regular time intervals, preferably as often as possible, every day is ideal, so that you buy into the market at an average price. That way, if the market continues to dip further, you'll guarantee that you buy in at a good point. And like I've shown you in this video, you're guaranteed to make more money in the long term by investing like this, rather than attempting to time the dip. It's actually a good thing to buy the dip, but it's when you try to time the dip that you end up missing out on potential stock market gains. You don't want to be the person that's waiting for the market to drop by 40 or 50%, because if that doesn't happen, you might not begin your investing journey for another 10 years. If you're curious about what I'm investing in personally, I'm currently dollar cost averaging into the market by investing $200 every day into VTI, which is a total stock market ETF that holds over 4,000 individual stocks. And I'm planning to keep this up no matter how bad the outlook on the economy gets. And if you want to get started investing into the stock market and buy into funds that I invest in like VTI, or if you just love free money, then make sure to sign up with Webull using the link in my description below to get six free stocks, which are guaranteed to be worth at least $34. It only takes a few minutes, so go get yourself some free stocks if nothing else. And with that being said, thanks for watching guys. Subscribe if you haven't already. I hope I convinced you that dollar cost averaging is the way to go, but if you still think otherwise, you can just keep on buying.